What's up? Elon Musk, who's named after the scent of futuristic grass, is buying Twitter for $54.20 a share. Shockingly, it's sparked yet another short-lived temper tantrum on the internet and has gotten characteristically brain-dead reactions from both sides of the political aisle. Elizabeth Warren, along with the 0.1% of her that's Native American, went on MSNBC to completely miss the point of what she was brought on to talk about. Instead of talking about the purchase, she just starts rambling about how phones are better than Twitter. If I want to use my telephone, I can call you, I can call somebody else, regardless of what telephone company they use. Not so with a platform like Twitter. The only way that I can communicate is I have to be on Twitter. One of the things we need is we need rules so that you can leave the Twitter platform and go to a competitor's platform and still be able to reach each other. As dumb as the idea of having to go on Juggalo Book to read Elizabeth Warren's tweet sounds, maybe she has a point. If your vague tweets about the tax code aren't respected on Twitter, then maybe they'll be respected by people who mainline Fago and dress like they're at a concert co-headlined by Kiss and Limp Bizkit. Are there aspects of certain social media companies that operate at a level where there should be a different form of regulation, or do you think it's generally fine right now? No, we, we need rules of the road. And look, there are going to be rules. Like I said, the only question is, will Elon Musk decide all the rule, rules by himself in a dark room? Or is it going to be the case that we're going to decide this as a country? We're going to make rules in a democracy. Ignoring her insinuation that there's ever been democratic choice about what's allowed on Twitter, I'm not sure I understand her depiction of Elon Musk as a Unabomber-esque figure sitting in the dark writing Twitter's content policies. Call me crazy, but I think somewhere between launching a car into space and naming his kid after a promo code, Elon Musk decided that doing things in the dark just wasn't for him. That being said, the best part of the video is the host, Ari Melber. It's obvious that he's not listening, which is surprising considering he's talking to a senator with a storied career in entertainment. If this is the way he reacts to a discussion with such a legend, I'd be interested to see him in other situations too. Forgetting the rules of the road. Getting in trouble with the law. Did you say you are ready to have my thang in your mouth? What do you mean by that? Taking some harsh criticism. It's about time somebody told you to keep your goddamn mouth shut. It's not well, Frank. Not well, my ass. Avid golfer and wall enthusiast Donald Trump managed to use Twitter to propel himself into a presidency that was the least controversial and most unifying in modern history. However, after a patriotic furry and a few of his buddies ran through a mall and broke into some insignificant building, Trump was permanently banned from the platform. As people with nothing going on struggled to redirect their anger, Trump worked behind the scenes with the only guy named Devin that doesn't own a gaming PC to build and launch Truth Social. With a name that sounds like a shindig at George Washington's house, Truth Social is essentially a Twitter clone for Trump to discuss the platform and brag about hanging out with country music stars. After his bid to buy Twitter was accepted, Elon Musk said that he would reverse Trump's ban, but Trump said that he won't be coming back, choosing to stay on Truth Social instead. While most people were confused by his choice, I think it's an excellent strategy. Stay on the site with the highest concentration of memes calling you a king, call it Truth Social, and then watch as people's heads explode when they can't refute your status as the first American monarch. Speaking of media sites that no one cares about, Outkick is a site that bills itself as a fearless sports media company where fearless, informed individuals can buy clothes and read about sports and politics. That description makes it sound like the site is run by people who were scared of the ball as kids and are now reporting on sports to overcompensate for the fact that they're still scared as adults. Anyway, they have a show called Don't At Me that's hosted by Dan Dockage, a guy who looks like Bert with alopecia and who talks like a presidential candidate who just found out about the internet. Gentlemen, what are your thoughts on the future of our democracy? We'll start with you, sir. Well, I believe that our democracy will be shaped the by... The future of our democracy hangs on to our characters that we type with our thumb. Thank you, Mr. Dockich. A few weeks ago, Dan started his show with this clip. Check this clown out. It's unbelievable. This is a little message to Elon Musk. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I can't. If 
you didn't get your boosters. You killed my grandmother. <laughs> now, for anyone whose brain is not a hand, that video was clearly a parody done by a comedian. But Dan, who's lost without his special helper, took it at face value. First, he pauses to collect his thoughts. How about that guy? You think that's real? Questions if the video is fake. People absolutely, totally lost their minds. And then fully commits to it being real. While we can't expect too much from a guy made of foam, the next segment really leaves a lot to be desired. After introducing a tweet from Elon Musk as the next topic, Dan struggles to find the tweet even though it's on the screen. The best tweet of the day yesterday. You got it here? Basically, you can see it where it says, hey, I hope my worst critics stay on here because, well, let me, let me, I got to get to this because I can't read it. So let me, give me one second here and I'm going to have it done right because this is a screw up that I just did. Dan then proceeds to spend a full minute looking for the actual tweet, completely oblivious to the firestorm he just created in the stock market. After suffering a 5% loss when Elon smoked weed on the biggest podcast in the world, Tesla investors started dumping their shares, terrified of what would happen now that he had injected himself with a brain-eating amoeba on a podcast run entirely by anthropomorphic monsters and a guy named Mr. Noodle. CNN's chief media correspondent and Humpty Dumpty supervillain, Brian Stelter, also weighed in on Elon's purchase of Twitter. In the CNN newsroom, which uses 3 million screens as its backdrop, Brian joined his colleagues to discuss the deal. After some unsurprisingly bland and predictable commentary, Brian uses a party analogy to describe Twitter after the takeover. If you get invited to something where there are no rules, where there is total freedom for, for everybody, do you actually want to go to that party? Or are you going to decide to stay home? And that's a question for Twitter users. Not that I thought Brian Stelter would have been the life of a party before, but I think he just confirmed that for us right there. I guess he has a point if you take it to the extreme, where all unspoken party rules are completely ignored, but it's probably best to give people the benefit of the doubt. That being said, his analogy loses all meaning when it's applied to Twitter. Aside from things that are already illegal, posting on Twitter has much less severe consequences than it would in real life. You can't post gun violence, you can't tweet a bombing, you can't upload torture, People like to say it's illegal to yell fire in a crowded theater, but you're definitely allowed to tweet it. At the end of the day, it sounds like Elon's gonna let people do what they want on Twitter, and Brian Stelter is invited to that party if he wants to come. Or, if the idea of a party with no rules doesn't appeal to him, he can stay home. Some more obscure members of the media weighed in as well. Jiu-Jitsu enthusiast and star of Zookeeper, Joe Rogan, was ecstatic to learn that the deal was accepted. And this is where we find ourselves with Elon Musk about to buy Twitter. Yeah, I saw that. Apparently it's it going down. It happened, it happened. Oh, it shit! What? Oh, shit! The press release has been announced. <gasps> he loves it, which makes it even funnier to hear how bored young Jamie is by the news. It's not his fault, though. He was probably just doing some dream training to improve his job performance. We got a movie star type of a superhero. Like if you had a movie and there was a guy who was like a like a hero in the movie who happened to be a billionaire, does wild shit, like makes his own rockets and drills under the city. That stuff would make for a decent superhero movie, but the part where he buys Twitter would make for the worst sequel of all time. Then again, in a world where superhero movies have characters that look like SeaWorld mascots and feature heroes hanging out at the Apple Store, it might not be so bad by comparison. Joe Rogan could maybe even do a cameo, where he explains how different animals like birds, bulls, and bears factor into the story. Fucking giant bear head clamped down on your dick and your asshole. <laughs> and you're going, no! And that's how you die. That's incredible, sir. I can't tell you how excited I am. Of course, none of these reactions are as dumb as the people who claim the deal is about white supremacy or who said they would leave Twitter if the deal went through. In fact, nearly every person who said they'd leave has already come back to Twitter, except for Howard Dean, who's best known for ruining his presidential campaign by cheering for it. <coughs> Dumber still are the people who accidentally revealed how meaningless their lives are by getting way too excited by the idea that they might be allowed back on Twitter. People like Marjorie Taylor Greene, the QAnon lunch lady, Laura Loomer, who somehow always looks like a wax figure of herself, and Taliban cheerleader and self-described incel Nick Fuentes. I'm an incel, alright? I know I'm an incel. 
At the end of the day, no one knows what Twitter will look like after the sale is finalized. Elon claims to be a free speech absolutist, but if we've learned anything from celebrities, billionaires, and politicians, it's that it's best to ignore their words and focus on their actions. Maybe the guy that spent an extra $150 million to make a weed reference isn't too concerned about what's best for poor people. And maybe having a lot of money doesn't inherently make him a supervillain. Either way, arguing about it will just make it easier for every person in this video to leave you behind once they suck the earth dry. And when they're up there, and you're still down here reading their tweets, you'll see that none of them, no matter if you agreed with them or not, were ever on your side. Alright, that's all I've got. If you enjoyed the video, please remember to like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. You just been driving me, driving me crazy. You've been driving me crazy, driving me, driving me crazy.